Hi, I'm Peter Berlingame of the Self-Defense Initiative. This video is the course curriculum for the Level 1 Advanced Rifle class. This will serve two purposes. One, as a review for the people that have already attended this class, and two, as an inducement for those of you who have not taken this class to do so. You get to see what's involved. The first thing we did in the class is cover the four rules of gun safety. One, treat all guns as if they were always loaded. Two, never let your gun point at anything you're not willing to destroy. Three, keep your finger off the trigger, up on the frame, until you're on target and made the decision to fire. Four, be sure of your target and what's around it. You are responsible for every bullet you fire, where it's final resting spot and anything it passed through to get there. We also talked about range rules. I run a hot range, which means that you are allowed to have and expected to have a loaded firearm at all times. It's the empty guns that become dangerous. As part of this, at the beginning of the class, as soon as everyone was kitted out, you were expected to put the rifle on and leave it on for the entire day. When you're taking breaks in the classroom, during lunch, bathroom breaks, you kept the rifle on you at all times. Part of the lesson is learning to live with your rifle. The next thing on the agenda was nomenclature. The various names of the parts of the rifle. Starting at the end of the barrel, we have the muzzle and a muzzle brake or flash hider. We talked a little bit about the different types and the benefits and um, detractions of those. We have the barrel itself. We have the front sight uh, assembly with the actual front side of the very top. The forend, we have the magazine, the magazine well, the ejection port which is closed right now, the magazine release button, trigger of course, pistol grip, the forward assist, the buffer tube, the butt stock itself, this is a collapsible three position, there's many different types out there. On to the other side, we have the safety selector, the fire control selector. We have a, um, some rifles will be equipped with a backup iron sight. We have the bolt release or bolt uh, catch, so you can lock the bolt back or release it when you need to reload. This particular type of rifle is called a flat top. Um, <clears throat> which allows you to mount various types of optics. On this particular one, I have a red dot sight. In particular, the Micro H1 by Aimpoint. We have the sling and the forward attachment point and a uh, coaxial mounted light. So those are the major parts of the rifle. We talked about loading. First, about loading the magazines. Unlike pistol magazines, Double column rifle magazines, the bullet just get, or I'm sorry, the cartridge just gets pushed straight down into the magazine. That gets inserted into the rifle, and we taught the importance of tugging on the magazine to make sure it's seated. This is especially critical when we're talking about fully loaded magazines. And I teach that you should be able to push the cartridges down at least a half an inch. While this may be a 30 round magazine, if you full it all the way up, the magazine spring won't be able to compress and when you go to insert it into the magazine, it won't fully seat. And then you run the bolt and you end up with an empty chamber. So insert the magazine firmly, tug on it to make sure it's in there, and then run the charging handle to run the bolt. We teach to keep the gun in a uh, shoulder ready to fire position so we use our support hand if it's if uh, we're shooting right-handed the left hand will hit the uh, the release on the charging handle pull the charging handle back let it go forward good idea to hit the forward assist. If we were shooting left shoulder then the right hand will come over and perform the same function. Let's again hit the forward assist. At this point the safety will go on. 
once the gun's loaded, it's a good idea to check to verify that it is indeed loaded. My preferred method of doing that is to bring the gun to about this position, bring the right hand over, the support hand over, catch the charging handle in this manner, pull the bolt back about an inch and a half or so, and then use the um, support hand and reach a finger in and actually feel the cartridge. This is, works at night and during the day. Let the slide go, let the bolt go forward firmly, hit the magazine, uh, hit the forward assist, close the dust cover. Some people don't like that because you're taking the gun out of battery and you're not sure if it's going to go back into battery and the forward assist is sort of poor at doing that. So they prefer to load the gun with a full uh, release of the bolt so it has the full travel and the full spring force behind it. Now, instead of taking the, the, uh, the bolt out of battery to check the chamber, what they do is before they load, they look at the magazine. Now this is a, um, a staggered feed magazine. It can feed from either the right side or the left side. The top cartridge in this particular case is on the right side. So if I insert the magazine, tug on it, run the bolt, and pull the magazine out again, and look, we can see that the cartridge on top is now on the left side. So it's obvious that the cartridge that was on the right is now in the chamber. So the advantage is that I haven't run, uh, I haven't taken the gun out of battery, but what I have done is taken the magazine out. So neither one's perfect. Um, I like to show both, so you have the option of picking which one you prefer. Once we did chamber checks, we talked about the various shooting stances. Um, these are fighting rifles, so we teach a fighting stance that works whether you're uh, empty-handed or you have a knife in your hand or you have a pistol in your hand or you happen to have a stick or a baton. The stance is always going to be pretty much the same, including with a rifle. So feet shoulder width apart, a little bit of separation of the strong leg back a little bit. Um, knees unlocked. We don't go crazy and crouch right down. We just unlock them so we get rid of the skeletal support and go to muscular support. So these big muscles in our body act as uh, recoil control as big springs. So for our normal standing uh, shooting position, it will look like this. As opposed to the old style where we would get pretty bladed to the target and put this elbow up to create a pocket for the um, for the buttstock and the support hand would be directly underneath it and this provides a lot of support and it's good for shooting but if I need to move or if I need to absorb something I'm not in the best position I'm being held up skeletally my knees are locked and I'm facing away from the target so if I need to move, if I need to go dynamic, it's going to be diff more difficult than if I start out in this position. It is slightly more precise, so for longer shots this makes sense. But considering these are fighting rifles and will probably be used from 100 yards in, we like to use just our regular fighting stance. We teach a uh, couple different kneeling positions. There's the classical one where you're... Um, your strong leg knee is on the ground and then you support your support elbow on the support knee and this is fairly stable. We also teach a high kneeling where it's the, the legs are in the same position but you don't support and you may use this to like shoot over the, uh, the hood of a car where you need to get a little higher. At uh, 52 years old and with a bit of arthritis in my ankles, I find that this position can be a little bit difficult for me. A lot of times I like to go to double kneeling. Both knees on the ground. There's also squatting or the uh, rice patty kneeling and it has the advantage of you staying on your feet. So if I need to move, I can as opposed to being on my knees and having to getting in and out of that position. And then we also taught uh, several prone positions.
At that point we talked about sighting in. We sight in at 40 meters, which is about 44 yards. And the reason we do that is with uh, this particular setup with the uh, the sight offset of about two and a half, three inches and the 223 cartridge. Um, with a 40 meter zero, we're never more than the distance of the sight offset, so two and a half, three inches. We're never more than two and a half, three inches above or below the aim, uh, the point of aim as far as the trajectory. So when we shoot to start with, the bullet starts below the point of aim, climbs up to meet it at 40 meters, continues rising, peaks out somewhere over 100 meters, starts coming back down, and then coincides again somewhere around 220 meters, and then around 260 meters, we're at our three inches. The advantage of this is you don't have to think about holdoffs. So anywhere from zero to 250, 280 yards, you just aim dead on, and you're never going to be more than two and a half, three inches off your point of aim. Simplifies things. So there's two places you have to think about hold off. One is when we're shooting closely. So if I wanted to shoot this target in the eyes, you can see that the sight is substantially above the barrel. So if I want to hit in this area, I'm going to have to put my sights on the top of his head. So sight offset is important at close range when you need to make a precise shot. If I was just shooting him in the chest, it wouldn't matter. But if I'm trying to make an ocular cavity shot, then the sight offset matters. The other place it matters is when you're shooting over or around cover. At this point, my sight is clear of the camera. So it looks like I have a clear shot, but you can see very clearly that the barrel is pointed directly at the camera. So if I fired a shot right now, I would destroy the camera. This, um, imagine that instead of a camera being a concrete wall, and I just fired around at about a foot or so into a concrete wall that's two feet or three feet away from my face, um, would there be some spalling of concrete and blowback? certainly possible and my bullet didn't hit the intended target which is even worse uh, you see this a lot with patrol cars uh, officers taking cover behind a patrol car uh, either the trunk or the um, the uh, hood of the engine compartment and the sights are clear and the barrel isn't and they put rounds into the car so that's the other place where sight offset is important once we explained sight offset and its importance, we did some sight offset drills. We did some close range precision drills where we had to uh, very quickly put a shot into the ocular cavity. And then we did some work around barricades. So you had to uh, understand how to deal with uh, sight offset. Um, because I don't like to uh, give problems without solutions, if you do need to shoot over cover and you want to keep your profile as low as possible, um, instead of this, try turning the gun sideways. Now the sights and the barrel are horizontally on the same plane. Um, I wouldn't want to do this with a shotgun because there's nothing behind the stock. Um, I wouldn't care to do it with a 308 either, but that's one of the nice things about the light recoiling 223, 556, is I don't necessarily have to be behind the gun with my, sh with my shoulder to deal with the recoil. Then we talked about slings. There's three basic types of sling. There's the old military type, which is a uh, generally a two-position sling or two-point sling. When we talk about points, we're talking about attachment points. So this is a two-point sling. It's attached in the back and it's attached at the front. Um, on my particular rifle, and in most situations you'll see these days, the sling is attached on the side of the rifle, and that allows it to hang very naturally against your body in front. The typical uh, older sporting or military slings, they were slung underneath and the rifle was meant to be carried on the strong shoulder in this manner. And that's fairly comfortable, but getting the gun into action is pretty slow. There's also the um, African carry, where the 
gun is on the support side muzzle down that's a little bit faster because you can keep your gun on the fore end which is important if you go to crouch down because you could stick your muzzle in the ground so you need to control the muzzle when you go to the kneeling position but it also allows pretty quick uh, shouldering of the firearm but this is a fighting rifle so we prefer to use a sling that's set up to keep the gun in front of you ready to use so it's my hands are free but bringing the gun into use is pretty quick the two position sling allows a lot of flexibility I uh, this one in particular is uh, the VTAC Viking Tactics um, and it has a quick adjust so I can run this sling out very uh, far or tighten it up depending on what I want I really like that feature and it allows a lot of versatility one of the things you want the sling to be able to do is allow you to shoot from either shoulder. Right now it's just over my neck, allows um, access to the gun very quickly. Sometimes I want to get the gun out of my way, so I can just thread my right arm through, put it around my back, tighten it up, and now I can have my hands free, the gun's out of my way if I need to do any sort of activity, um, and still pretty quick to get into action. If you've got enough length, you don't even have to thread the arm out. Um, sometimes I'm working with the pistol, and I want to get this off my right side. I just thread my left arm through, put it around over here. Now I can access the pistol. If I was doing some building clearing in very tight controlled quarters, I may want to get the gun out of my way, the rifle out of my way, and work with the pistol. This also allows a um, around the back muzzle up position. If you tighten it down a lot and then put it around in this position, that's the most out of the way it can get. So if I need to climb, do something on a ladder, this is the way I'll put the rifle. A single point sling will have one attachment point. These are very, very popular these days. The sling just goes over the head and the gun dangles straight down in front of you. This allows very quick access to the gun from either shoulder and has that advantage. Disadvantage, if it's right in front of you, it's very easy for it to point at your feet. Most people, if they're not using the gun, will put it around to their left or their support hand side get it out of their way you can thread an arm through it if you really want to get it out of the way they're very comfortable to carry and very quick to use the disadvantage is that there's only one spot that there's that's being controlled by the sling so the gun tends to really swing around a lot so if you're doing something very active you're running getting in and out of vehicles, that can be a problem. Still, they're very popular and um, a lot of people like them. Now there's some hybrids that are um, easily switchable from one to the other where they have snap swivels so you can go from a single point to a double point uh, and back again very, very quickly. One thing I found in carrying a rifle all day is even these little ARs which are around uh, seven to eight pounds carrying them for all day gets to be wearying uh, can really hurt your neck and I find a lot of times in my lower back I'll start getting pains after about six to eight hours so one of the things I like in a sling is a padded section I want that to be attached, not like those luggage pads where you know the, the, the pad always is in the wrong place. So uh, in the VTAC, the padded sling is $10 more. I think it's $10 well spent. Next on the agenda, we talked about the Farnham method of running a line. That's John Farnham of Defense Training International. The first command is interview stance. Now in the interview stance, your hands are off the gun, you're in a low profile. And you're moving around and you're being aware 360. So let's say the, um, the firing line is here, and I'm going to walk along the firing line as far as I can until I run into another person on the line. 
and I'm going to be um, scanning the entire time and I'll be giving verbal commands. Sir, stay back. Don't come any closer. Ma'am, stay where you are. The police are on their way. This keeps me moving, it keeps me aware, and it teaches me to be communicative to the public, to the bad guys, and to my partners. The next command is move and mount. Move and mount, not just mount. Move and mount! You step and you bring the gun up on target. At this point, the safety gets turned off. If no other commands are given, after two seconds or so, bring the gun back down to a ready position, get off where you just were, and go back to your interview stance. Sir, stay back. I can't help you, stay where you are. The next command is threat. It may be before moving mount, moving mount, threat, boom or it may be just threat. Stay where you are, don't come any closer. The police are on their way. Threat! Boom! As soon as you've taken care of the threat, the gun comes into a flat stock ready position, safety stays off. Fingers in the register position on the frame. Step off the X, turn into known territory. Do a 360 degree scan, including above you and then come back around. And then the last one is the stand down procedure where you will make sure the safety is on, do a chamber check, close the dust cover, and relax, sling the gun. We then covered reloads. As in pistols, there's three types, administrative, tactical, combat, or speed reloads. In the administrative one, we're taking a break, we're you know, in a class, we're training, and my relay is not shooting at this point. I need to get my gun fully operational, fully loaded for the next drill. And I want to do that safely, so I will take the magazine out without hitting the trigger, without touching the gun other than the trigger, uh, the magazine release. Take the partial magazine out, find a full one, insert it, Firmly tug on it to make sure it's in there. Because I haven't shot the gun empty, there's a round in the chamber, I'm good to go. The second type of reload is the tactical reload. There's a lull in the action. I fired some shots, boom, boom, boom. There's a, uh, a lull, there's no threat at the moment. There may be another one, I'm not sure that the fight is over. I want to get the gun topped off so it's fully loaded. I have more magazines. So the first thing I'm going to do is locate a magazine. I want to maintain control of this one because it still has some cartridges in it. I want to hang on to those. So you're going to make an L shape between the new magazine and the old magazine that's still in the gun. Hit the magazine release, draw out the one that's in there, insert the new one firmly. Tug on it. See, it wasn't in. Firmly tug on it. Put this one away. You may need that. The third type of reload is the combat or speed reload. We're in the fight. We fired the gun. It is now empty. It may be that you know that it's empty because you pulled the trigger and nothing happened. Or if you shoot enough, you'll find that you've noticed that the, the bolt comes back and stays back and you didn't feel it going forward back into battery and that's an indication that the gun is empty also. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the empty magazine while my support hand goes gets a fresh one. I like to give a little extra oomph to the magazine that's getting ejected by twisting the gun to my support side. That also puts the magazine well into position where I can see it and easily insert the new magazine. Do that firmly, tug on it to make sure it's loaded in there properly, and then you'll notice that my thumb is my thumb can hit the bolt release right there, and I can get back in the fight. We next covered shooting from the support shoulder and why you may need to do that. 
While this is my preferred method of shooting off my strong side shoulder, there may be reasons for me to want to shoot off my support side shoulder. One, I may be around left side cover. At that point, I want to be able to shoot off my left shoulder so that I'm presenting a lower profile around the cover as possible. This is where the red dot sights really shine. It's a lot easier to do this off of your support shoulder than trying to line up two iron sights. Another thing is that um, I may have gotten hurt. Um, this hand may not be functional, so I may need to shoot just with my support hand only. It may be that this eye has been taken out of action. I've gotten some, you know, some uh, spalling or something for some reason. I got something in my eye. I can't use my right eye. It may be good to be able to shoot off my left shoulder with my left eye. We then did drills, transitioning from side to side. Very often that looks like this with a side step, shooting off the sh uh, strong side shoulder and then sidestep transitioning to the support shoulder. For transitioning, what we do is plant the butt first. I like to push forward to clear this sling so that it doesn't strangle me. So I push the gun forward, plant the butt first. Then the shooting hand comes off the pistol grip, goes to the forehand, the support hand slides back to the pistol grip. I like to keep my thumb in contact with the safety, so if I'm shooting left-handed, my thumb stays on the left side of the gun. The last thing we covered was transitioning to the sidearm. We talked about when and why you would need to do that. For some reason, this may stop working. It's empty or it's malfunctioned and I may want to transition to my pistol, my sidearm. When would you do this? You would do this because it's gonna be faster to go to a sidearm than it is to fix this, even if it's just that it's empty. Drawing your pistol is gonna get you a shot on target faster than reloading this. And certainly if you've got a jam, a double feed, or a bolt override, that's gonna be a lot longer out of action. So pistol's gonna be faster. When should you transition to the pistol? Basically, that's going to depend on you. How far away can you hit? I'd certainly say within 7 to 10 yards, you should transition to the pistol because you should be able to hit at 7 to 10 yards without any issue. If you're good, then you may want to transition out to 25 yards. And I know some people that are outstanding with a pistol and can hit with no problem at 100 yards. So it might be that if they need to you know, return fire quickly that they go to the pistol even at 100 yards. Now the thing is if you're that far away the threat from the bad guy is decreased and it might make more sense to move or go to cover or both. There's a couple of different ways of doing this. One is just letting the gun hang, drawing your pistol and going to a normal two-handed grip. The nice thing is I've got two hands on the pistol and that allows a lot of control. The bad thing is this thing is moving around and has no control. So if I need to move around while I'm doing this, this could affect me. Um, it's not unforeseeable that the safety gets swiped off and the trigger gets pulled by some of my gear while that's happening and I shoot myself in the foot. Another way of transitioning is to just take your strong hand off the, off the uh, rifle bring the gun down on the outside of your support side leg and hang on to it with your support side hand controlling it and then drawing with just your strong hand. Disadvantage is I'm shooting one handed. Advantage is I'm controlling the rifle. Once again both work. Both have good points and bad points. I like to teach both of them so you can make your choice based on an informed decision. You're an adult and I'll treat you like it. At that point the day was ended except for questions and comments. Once again, thank you for watching. My name is Peter Burlingame of the Self-Defense Initiative. Be safe out there.